Hi, my name is Salamawit, and we are part of the DC Public Library Teen Council. I'm joined with my co-hosts, Ginger, Sherry, Michael, and Tony. The Teen Council is DCPL's leadership program that gives teens the opportunity to perform services and programs for their neighborhoods and the city at large. We are celebrating the opening of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library through special programming just like this. We're so excited to have Marley Diaz, the founder of the 1000 Black Girl Books campaign and the host of a new Netflix show, Bookmarks Celebrating Black Voices. Marley started the 1000 Black Girl Books campaign when she was just 11 years old because she was frustrated and felt that teachers weren't assigning books that featured black characters. The goal was to collect 1000 books where black girls were the main characters, but she has ended up getting over 12,000 books. In 2018, she wrote her own book called Marley Diaz Gets It Done and So Can You. She has spoken at the White House, multiple summits, and was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 25 most influential teens in 2018. She is also the youngest on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list. Here's a clip from her new TV show, Bookmarks Celebrating Black Voices. Hi, I'm Marley Diaz. Welcome to Bookmarks Celebrating Black Voices. Peace, y'all. This is common. I'm Tiffany Haddish. I'm Caleb. I'm Marseille Martin. I'm Misty Copeland. I'm Karamo, your friend. I'm Lupita Nyong'o. I am here to read a very special book to you today. As for beauty, Mama said, it begins with how you see yourself, not how others see you. Every single person you see above me is perfectly designed just the way they are. Tap, tap, clickety clack. Music my hair makes just for me. Why would some people say their race is better than another? Because they are afraid? Mm -hmm. I am brown and amazing. Can't you see? You came in as a lump of clay. But when my man is done with you, they'll want to post you up in a museum. There is nothing that you can't do. What do you want to be when you grow up? So I would like for you to tell me something about you that I wouldn't know. What advice would you give to someone to encourage them not to give up? Besides your hair, what else do you love about yourself? Say it with me. I am perfectly designed. Welcome, Marley, and thank you so much for being here. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you all for having me. So tell us a little bit about the show and how you got involved with the project. So Bookmarks is a 12 episode live action series for kids around ages three to eight, but I encourage everyone to watch the show. Um, the show is focused on making sure that we are promoting literacy through having black celebrities reading stories about black kids to kids everywhere. Um, I got involved with the project because, you know, a lot of things come up on my desk that are super exciting, um, whether it's my mom telling me or people that work with 1000 Black Girl Books. And this opportunity was given to me as just in, uh, as the first place to really talk about books. Um, the people that were involved in the creation of the show were interested in my opinion on what a kid show should look like that was centered around Black stories, which then led to would you like to be a part of a kid's show that was focused around celebrating black stories? Um, and that my opinion uh, and my expertise in some ways about the experiences of promoting diversity on a large platform led me to be the host of the show and the executive producer credits as well. So I'm super excited and I love the project so much. I know a lot of people online love my outfits and all these things, but to me, one of the things that I care the most about is that we also have a resource guide and a website. So um, it's called netflixbookmarks.com and it has a list of some of the other titles that are maybe out of the range for the show, but still focus on the things that we care about and the messages that we aim to spread. So some of the authors that may have been independent authors that did not, you know, didn't have picture books that weren't necessarily used for the same format we were looking for are still available and we wanna make sure that we can give parents and especially educators access to these stories, even though they may have not made it into the specific episode. That's great. Could you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for the name of the show? 
So for us, it was really important that um, we wanted to have bookmarks and then something else. So we knew that it was going to be like book smarts, book this, but it had to say book in it because it's a back to school season. And we want to make sure that if parents see it, they're going to think, oh, that's so smart. It's so clever. Um, and to really aim towards people that might just be browsing on the website or on the computer. Um, we were also thinking about we wanted to have a second part of it and to make sure that it was still centered around the fact that we were focusing on the the experiences of Black people. So it was it was going to be celebrating, highlighting, loving, uh, appreciating. So we knew that it was super important to have something like that. And celebrating really stuck, just had a better flow, in my opinion, um, to make sure that we knew that although it is centered around books as a whole and the joy that storytelling can bring us, but it also does have a Black narrative and Black lens that come into the show. How were the books selected? And did you have any role in that process? Yes, I had a, a little bit of a role in the process and it was super exciting. I got to write down a list of people I wanted to read, write down a list of my favorite children's books, um, and a lot of those got to come to life. There are some that I hope if we get a second season we would see because I am crossing my fingers for some of these people that um, I think could be great storytellers. Um, but it was, yeah, like I said, in the original kind of development of what was the show going to look like, my opinion was very heavy because I knew that for a lot of parents, when they think about diversity and inclusion, I might be the only face they think of before they think of Netflix as a place that is going to be focused on that. So they knew that for a lot of people that might see me on my, see this on my social media page, they knew that it was coming from my heart and my own intention. And every book that is up there, whether I had heard of it before the show or not, is someone a book that I've read and that I like. Uh, and I really think is focused around kind of these four core things that we thought about. So it's identity, um, respect, justice, and action. And that's kind of the course of how the titles go with episodes in their order. We wanted to make sure that kids knew that all of them are beautiful and they are important and that, you know, building the framework for thinking that you can change the world can slowly develop into actually changing the world. That's so cool, Marley. Um, I have a question about the show. What do you hope it will accomplish? So there are two things I really hope Bookmarks will accomplish. I hope that it can set um, kind of a precedent for more kids to be involved with the process of being in the media and being on, on TV shows. They get their kind of their opinions out there, their own unique perspectives, because every decision, you know, whether it was my earrings or the book that I was going to read was a part of my own open discussion. There was nothing that was pushed on me in one way or another. And I think that's super important, especially for kids that have dreams of being in front of a camera one day that they know that their voice matters even at a young age. And those two things are not separate or going against one another. I think the second thing is to really show that I wanna be a support system for teachers. Right now is a super, super difficult time for both teachers and parents because parents have to learn how difficult it is to be a teacher, if that means they're online with their kids um, and they're watching their kids navigate new spaces, new terminology, new words, new assessments, and it's really difficult. So by having the show both on Netflix and on Netflix Junior's YouTube channel for free, it's one way that we can show to teachers that this show is obviously about still you know, being successful and getting people to watch and appreciate it, but it's also about making sure that we're helping the people that allow for this to be possible, the people that are actually in the classrooms and are guiding some of the perspectives of super young children. Yeah, and I know there are a ton of cool people involved is there any specific guest or reading that you're most excited for people to see? And I know you mentioned that you have a couple of books lined up for next season. Are there any other people you would like to have next season? So there are a ton of people. We don't know if there's a next season or not. This is all me speaking in the future, but I would love to see some celebrity couples. Like I think that people like Gabrielle Union and Dwayne Wade or um, Sierra and Russell Wilson, I think having uh, two people together reading one book, I think would be super awesome for me. I, I'd, I'd seen the list, you know, of who was going to read books. And I was so excited to see that Lupita was on the list, that Lupita Nyong'o is going to be re reading her own book. You guys don't even know. I was so excited. She filmed it in her home, so I didn't get to see it when she recorded it. But I was like, because I didn't, I didn't get to actually see it before the episodes came out. I was beyond excited because I've read her book and I, I she sent it to me originally when it first came out. And I was like, how does she know who I am? What is this? <laughs> um, and now to see that we're on the same, you know, in the same place working together to build something like this is something that I think a lot of people didn't expect. When mama came in to wake her for school the next morning, Suwe rose to find not a trace of daylight in her midnight skin. Suwe told Mama everything. 
mama asked, What is your name? Sulwe, she muttered. And what does it mean? Star, Sulwe whispered. Brightness is not in your skin, my love. Brightness is just who you are. As for beauty, Mama said, rubbing Sulwe's stomach the way she always did to comfort her. You are beautiful. Sulwe sighed. Well, you're beautiful to me. But you can't rely on what you look like to make you feel beautiful, my sweet. Real beauty comes from your mind and your heart. It begins with how you see yourself, not how others see you. Yeah, so we know that like a lot of what you're known for comes from your look, your love of books and your um, involvement in activism. So I wanted to ask, what role has literature played in your life and how do you think it can influence you? I think that books and reading and literacy um, as a, a whole have really defined a large part of who I am. Some of the uh, most compliments I get from adults is like, you're so mature for your age and you, you speak so fluently and well and you're just so articulate. It's really because I spent a lot of time around words. You know, as an only child, I know that I have a different experience than other kids that, you know, I, I spent a lot of time by myself. And when I was a kid, I wanted to know how can I still explore my own imagination because I couldn't draw, I couldn't sing, I didn't like to dance, and I didn't have a lot of the skills or interests that so many other kids have. I wasn't a sports person when I was a kid. So I found that, you know, reading was a way that I always felt like I fit into some space and I was welcome in some world, whether that was reading books that did I didn't have characters that looked like me um, or was having an especially feeling a connection with characters that did look like me and realizing that there was a possibility of just being outside of the space that I was in and moving into kind of a new experience that is brighter, is better, is more exciting. Um, and I think this definitely influenced me to be confident in myself and to know that even if I'm experiencing moments where I don't feel like I'm qualified, there are some universe out there where there is a story of a girl or a young person that is qualified enough to do what I'm doing. Yeah, on that note, since we're celebrating the opening of MLK Library, what has your relationships been with libraries and what role should they play in youth's lives? Libraries are extremely important. We have a public library in my town that is super cool. I used to go there all the time as a kid. My mom would take me and I, I think it's super important that we make sure that public services and resources are in spaces where kids can have easy access to them. I think some people in my town don't even know we have a public library, which is something that you know could be bothersome because it's not in walking distance to many places in residential areas. So I think one thing we do have to fight for is keeping libraries alive and making sure that they have you know, spaces that have computer labs now and have projectors and have new books um, so that we can keep them as a place that becomes a cultural center and a way for so many other people to see themselves and to learn more about the world around them. I 100% wholeheartedly agree with you, Marley. And speaking about books and reading and things like that, um, on our Teen Council blog, we recommend a lot of books to teenagers. So I was wondering, what's a book that you think every teenager should read? I think one book that, oh, that's so hard. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a book that is on my list that I haven't read yet that I think we should all read. And then there's one book that I have read that I think everyone should read. So the book that I've read that I think everyone should read is Another Brooklyn by Jacqueline Woodson. So the reason why I like this book is because it talks a lot about friendship. And I think for a lot of teenagers, our whole lives can be centered around friendships. And, you know, we feel like the way that other people perceive us defines who we are, the, the world that we exist in right now will be our world forever. Um, and I think one thing that another Brooklyn does is it highlights the ability that the world has to change. Things will never stay the same. And we need to sometimes learn to celebrate that certain aspects of our life, whether it's our friendships, our economic status, what we care about, what we like, are all subject to change. And change is not a bad thing. So even though the book is really just about an adventure of four girls and their friends growing up in Brooklyn, it talks more about how Brooklyn changed as a borough, how the girls changed as young women, and how the men around them changed becoming young men. So I think that book is a super great book. 
Now, one book I would recommend for all teenagers that I haven't read is it's called, I have it read on my bookshelf. It's called The Ones We've Been Waiting For and it's by Charlotte Atler. I have not read it yet, but it highlights so many other young activists and I, I'm not in the book, but I got it sent to me and I read you know, through the glossary and seeing some of the people. And I think one thing that the book does super well is it actually gives you the names, information and experience of other young activists. So for a lot of people, they might think, okay, there's no one in my area that cares about the world. I'm gonna be the only person that's gonna be at the rallies or the protests or trying to launch Instagram accounts or TikToks that you know educate people on these things. But in reality, with books like that, they give us information about the steps that other people have taken to experience success in changing the world. And then we can use those things, whether it's you know simple action steps or ideas to put them into our own space and our own situation and try to make them better. Those sound like great books. We should all check those out. Um, <laughs> can you think of a time where you've made an impact on a kid's life through a project or was there another memorable encounter that you've had? So I've had several moments where I felt like this is completely unreal and that like, you know, what, what you do is just not, it's not happening. There's no way. Um, but, you know, having collected 12,000 books is a lot already to think about. But one moment that will, there are two moments that will always stand out to me is um, at the beginning of 1000 Black Girl Books, I was two weeks to my deadline of when I was going to donate the books into Jamaica. I had collected 800 no, I collected 200 so far and I had 800 left. Let me fix that. I had collected nothing. I was doing, I felt so unaccomplished because I had worked from November to February of the next year to try and collect 1,000 books. Shouldn't be that hard. 200 books a month, super easy. I collected 200 books over five months. So it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. And I felt super like, the good thing is that my friends really didn't know what I was doing, so I didn't feel like I was super like unsuccessful or unaccomplished, but it was my own personal goal. It was something that I wanted to do, and I felt like if you want to change something, you actually have to be about it, and I didn't feel like I was about it because I wasn't successful. Um, that wasn't up to my control, though. I did. I feel like I did everything in my power to succeed, but then I got a call to do a radio interview for a radio station in Pennsylvania. That call became a Fox interview in Philadelphia that call became the Ellen show. And then when it was the Ellen show, my life completely changed and did a complete 180. We had books covering, and this is really the moment. So we had where the office where we were collecting books. It was once a very small table with 200 books, you know, all stacked on top of each other to the entire floor of the office being covered in books and not being able to walk in. So for me, that was something that was super cool. And seeing the mail, it was actually the mail woman that was at the office building that would pick up and deliver the books from the bottom of the office to where our floor was. It's like, what is going on here? You guys are really ordering this much stuff from Amazon? What are we doing? Like, you know, her being surprised at um, the fact that that was even happening because we didn't tell her necessarily and then explaining to her that it was a book drive. So for me, moments like that really stand out. And then getting to actually go to Jamaica and to see that even in a space that is 90 something percent black, a lot of these black girls had never seen themselves on the cover of a book. Um, and even though they might've seen black girls in books, they never felt as though it was someone that had hair like them, had a body like them, lived in the same place as them. Um, and that means a lot for so many other young kids. And it's something that we take for granted because if you never know that books like that are out there, you're never gonna look for them. Yeah, that's, that's really inspiring. Like self-motivation, I think is something that we all kind of struggle with. And so who do you think a person or an event that has most contributed to you kind of being motivated to reach your goals and not give up? Um, the person hands down that has motivated me the most is my mom. I know that in what I do, I, I, I do interviews by myself. I post on Instagram by myself. I do everything that might seem like my public experience is individual. It is 100% not. She helps me with and I say every single last thing, I mean every single last thing. She helped me iron the shirt. You know, she helps me pick the earrings. She does everything with me. Um, and she sacrifices a lot of her own personal time and her own personal endeavors to help me pursue this campaign. She thought it was going to be just 200 books like I did, and it turned into 12,000. So you really never know where things can take you. Um, and her continual push, even as I experienced more momentum, to keep looking for new ways to innovate the campaign and now it's kind of expanded into having my own book and focusing on not only collecting books, but helping other young people develop their own projects and showing that 1000 Black Girl Books has spanned out into different lanes and, and being on a Netflix show and having written articles with L.com, like things like that. 
don't happen unless there are people that are continually motivating you to believe in your own abilities and to want to get better at those things. She wanted, she was the person that asked me what I was going to do about all being sick and tired of reading about white boys and their dogs. That was a frustration that was in my diary for three months. And then I told it to her and she immediately wanted me to take action. So I think having people like that, I know is not the experience for everybody. And that's something that I wish every teacher could try their best to do. And every parent can try their best to do is to listen to their kids when they complain and then ask them how they can actually solve it. Because a lot of us have things that we are annoyed by. And trust me, I have a few that I haven't gotten, you know, the chance to really work on. But there's something in our lives that is worth changing. And I think we have to have people in our lives that are focused on helping us do that. And speaking of your success as an activist and all that you've accomplished, I'm sure you have some insight. So I wanted to ask what steps do you think youth can take to get involved in activism in their communities? So this is one piece of advice I think is really important for teenagers. You know, I'm not an expert and I've had a unique experience, but I think for people, a lot of the times when they think about social action, activism or projects that they want to take on, they think about world peace, world hunger, um, you know, things that are super big. When we use the word world in front of any issue, we automatically make it in some way or another out of our own reach. Um, I think people... They, and they forget that, you know, as I've collected 12,000 books, it's co it started in my own school library. And we have to start to sort of think globally and think that we want to solve, you know, the, the worldwide lack of access to diverse books. But we have to start in our own communities. We have to fix our own libraries first. We can't seek out to help, you know, a lot of the times, especially in America, we say kids in Africa, if we can't help kids that are in our own town. You know what I mean? And we definitely want to help those other communities all across the world, but we also have to focus on, can we actually implement these own things into our own lives? Are we healthy eaters? Are we people that care about the planet? Are we people that actually help homeless people that we see on the street? Are we you know, doing the things that we want other people to be about? And I think for a lot of teenagers, it's really important to be ambitious. And I'm an ambitious person myself. But we also have to understand that ambitious does not mean ignorant to the issues that exist in your own life. We have to solve those first. There's no way in the world that I could have solved and, and helped so many other kids and still worked out so many other kids if I couldn't fix my own day libraries. You know what I mean? Um, and we have to be focused on doing those things as well before we can go out and, and be about kind of a worldly sense. Um, well, when you bring up ambition, like, I think it's obvious, like your passion is definitely evident. Um, but I bet that your activism takes a toll on your energy. So I want to know, like, how are you juggling all of these commitments while navigating your teen years? I mean, you're, I mean, we're, you know, you're still a kid. And so do you have any advice for how people can, you know, find that balance in their life? I will be honest with you. I do not think I could give you any good advice on this girl. I am tired. I try my best. Okay. So there are some things I can say that have worked for me. I definitely find things that I like to do um, that are independent of 1000 black girl books. Nothing in reality is completely independent because it always comes back to reading or writing or being creative, which are all things that I, I'm sure we all care about in one way. There's no way I can just forget and kind of close the box that is 1,000 Black Girl books um, in my life. And I don't think that's a good idea to do for anybody. But um, for me, I just started online school last week. So the, the thing that's good about online school is that it's kind of, it might sound a little painful, but it's from 7.30 to 11.55 a.m. So it's in the morning. So I'm waking up at 6.30 and then I'm going to class and then I'm doing stuff like this. But the good thing is that I feel like um, I have other like passions and interests and side projects. Like I like to knit and I've been making headbands for my friends. You know, I've been chasing a bag, you know, independent of this and, and trying my best to do things that are, are still fun and, and can benefit me personally, ex ex uh, aside from these other things. You know, I like to go shopping. I like to do all these things um, and focused on things that bring me joy and just trying to always find time for them. I always have to advocate for myself. And I think it's important for every kid to learn to advocate for themselves, even when it's hard. My parents never pushed me over the edge. I've never really felt like that before, but I definitely have experienced moments of being overwhelmed and just remembering that there will be times of joy coming soon. I always just try to be optimistic about the fact that I know nothing is forever. So even if it's super bad right now and I'm super tired, I know that they still care about who I am as a person and I will get rest at some point. Marley, that's amazing. I also love to knit and love shopping. So I feel you there. But speaking of balance and how to keep things, you know, in check in your life, I wanted to ask you, how has social media 
impacted your activism? And have you ever received any hate to your project, A Thousand Black Girl Books, or any hate to you as a person? And how do you deal with that? So um, that's a good question. Because social media is the kind of like the, the founding and the core of what my campaign is. It is a hashtag. That's the official name. It's still a hashtag. I never took it off. Um, so it is important that I started this as posting pictures of me, you know, standing next to a book. Please donate and send the link here. I appreciate it so much. So it all started online through my own parents' accounts. And then after things started to pick up more steam, I had my own. I've experienced definitely some hate comments and things bother me to a certain extent, but a lot of the times, um, it doesn't, you just have to kind of like brush it off and realize that there are so many more positive ones. I know for a lot of people and a lot of people on social media might say that that one hate comment will stick out to you and hurt you a lot. It does. Trust me, it definitely does, but it doesn't define who I am. And I don't, and I don't think a positive comment or a negative comment defines who I am. I don't let out any of those things. So when I get, you know, super, like when people are super, super into something, that means a lot to me. But when people super, super aren't into something, that doesn't, I, I can't let it mean as much. You can't weigh a positive and a negative as completely equal. They are not equal. Um, so what I try to do in my head is think about, if there are some people that are feeling it, then that's all right with me. I feel proud of myself for that. And if there are people that don't and are coming from a place of hate, that's not my business, you know, and leave that leave that be. I, I've never had the experience or have wanted to like clap back to a hater. I know that's super popular along a lot of people, but I feel like giving a person attention or spotlight for being negative and not giving people attention or spotlight for being positive is not fair. So I'm not gonna respond to one comment just because it's mean. Um, I'm gonna respond to the positive comments and leave the other one alone. And was there a defining moment in your life that kind of changed your perception of the world or maybe triggered your love of reading? Um, I don't know, change my perception on the world, okay. So I think for me, one thing that might've changed my perception on the world is coming out with my own book and it being published by Scholastic, which was a, a big deal because it's in book fairs. And, you know, I used to be a kid that would go to Scholastic book fairs and now to see myself in them is crazy. Um, I think it's definitely people's shock that I was capable of doing that was something that changed a little bit of my own kind of perceptions. There are a lot of people that are cheerleaders and champions of what I do but then are super, super surprised that I'm capable of doing great things. You know, they're always the ones that are the most shocked. And that can be hurtful in some ways because you're, you're like, okay, that's a positive emotion, but it is an emotion that means you didn't expect greatness out of them, that you didn't expect it to be good. Um, and for me, that is something that I, I experienced a lot of, especially doing, I had to do a press tour where I went from New York to Chicago to Philadelphia to the country of Philadelphia to Los Angeles and back to New Jersey all while I was in school and I was doing this um, completely like without telling my friends. I they knew I had a book coming out, but I, I just left school. I was like, I'm over it. I need to, I have to work. I'm over it. I need to just focus on this for now. Um, and people being surprised that I was capable of doing that. Um, and it was something that was surprising for myself, but hearing that all the compliments I got is that you're so mature for your age. You're so this, you're so that. And it's, un we, unex we didn't expect this. Um, it's something that can definitely take a toll on you because you're like, well, you should by now. If you did research, if you watched the YouTube video, you would know it was coming for you in some ways. Um, so I think I always take those things as negative and, and positives in some way, but it doesn't really take a toll on who I am. I think as I get more mature and older, people will see this coming, that this is the way I talk and this is how I feel about these things. And I get to be a little bit more passionate and opinionated. But when I was around like uh, 13 and 12, it was super hard when people were always just so shocked that someone so young could do something so great and that all these things were complete opposites in their eyes. Yeah, I mean, you're already such an inspiration. Um, not to get too deep, what do you want to be remembered or known for? Okay, I like this question. I don't, don't have to worry about getting too deep because <laughs> here's the thing. So I don't think about it as like, okay, after you die, what is your legacy? And I know that's kind of the question, but girl, I ain't dying anytime soon. So we're <laughs> fine. But um, I think one thing for me is that I, I want to be known. And I think this is kind of a weird thing is that I want to be known as the reason why someone that was more successful than me wanted to start something. Like, you know what I mean? It's that someone that makes the next billion dollar company saw me and decided to do that. That's something that would mean a lot to me. Like someone that creates the next Apple, someone that creates the next like um, Microsoft, like I want people to see that or like the next Black Lives Matter campaign, like something like of that caliber that is changing the world completely. I want them to say in their acceptance speech for some award, 
that Marley Dias was the person I saw that made me want to do that. To me, that is like the coolest thing in the world. Imagine being in someone's acceptance speech for like a Nobel Peace Prize. Like you, that means that you had to do so good at whatever you were caring about. You had to be so good that you could touch their heart and motivate them for the rest of their life. That's something that I want to do. I don't really care about whatever I do personally or whatever awards I get because I don't have that person that I feel like, except for my mom, I don't think there's any person I could say in an acceptance speech to my, my mom and my dad for people that have really helped push me to feel like I'm great. Um, and I want that for other kids. And I want to be that person for them, even if I don't know them or I've never met them, to say like, okay, okay, I, I support you and I see you. And that I am a part of like a catalyst for change in their own lives. That is a beautiful answer. I'm absolutely floored. That is amazing. Thank you. You guys, you guys would freak out too. If you were at the Grammys or something and someone just randomly said your name that you've never heard of in a speech, You'd be like, what the, like, you know what I mean? That would freak everybody out. And that's something I would think is like the coolest way to, to think about celebrating your life. That, that's so sweet. I love that answer so much. But now we're gonna have some fun. We're gonna play some fun questions. I'm gonna start off. These are like this or that question. So like, think fast. No, <laughs> don't, don't hesitate. Okay, okay. So the first question is chocolate or vanilla? Go. Chocolate. All right, so um, your favorite song or artist right now? Uh, Sula. Did you hear me? Yes, I hear. Uh, what is your dream job? My dream job, I think journalist right now. I really enjoyed it a lot, and I've done a couple articles for L.com, which is super, super cool. So I think journalist, that's what I'm going to say. Oh, my gosh, cool. Who's your celebrity crush? Uh, I don't have one. Skip it. Skip it. <laughs> okay. If you could be anywhere in the world right now, where would you be? Um, oh, anywhere. Probably Paris. Away from, like, just everything. Yeah. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Uh, I'm a midday queen. I know that's not the option. I'm a midday queen. I'm a <laughs> kind of girl. And I know it's a completely underrated time of day because everyone's awake. Everything is open and you could do anything. Like you don't have to worry about nothing else. <laughs> Favorite book genre? Um, I think realistic fiction. I like to relate to things. I like to be like, oh, this completely applies to what I'm going through right now. Um, if you could have any superpower, which power would you have? Uh, stopping and speeding up time. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm impatient. I'm a little impatient, though. So if I could stop and go back and fix things, I would do that. Okay. Twitter or Instagram? Instagram. Twitter is a different beast. <laughs> do you have a favorite food? Um, that's a tough question. Okay. I think sushi is my favorite food. And if you don't like seafood, I'm sorry, but you're missing out. Um, I think seafood as a whole is my favorite type of food. And besides your own favorite TV show? Uh, you shouldn't have said besides your own. You knew I was going to say mine. Um, okay. I think Patriot Act, um, which is a show by Hassan Minhaj, who's on um, Netflix, but just got canceled. But you should watch it because it could teach you a lot and it's super funny. Yes. I literally just watched one of his one of his uh, features or whatever. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> He should have done them for like chemistry or physics, like something I was taking in school. I would have watched it and actually learned something in school. <laughs> All right. Uh, what about, okay, so what's uh, your next project? Do you have anything coming up? So right, right now, the thing that is we're actually doing literally right now is Green Ribbon Week. Like I told you guys before, we're focused on promoting positive mental health. Um, it is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, which is super important. But we also want to encourage the kids that are on a different side of things and their feelings may be more positive. How can we stay in that space? How can we make sure that we prevent things um, from getting to a point where I might think about hurting yourself or others? How can we just be like, let's be happy and actually celebrate being happy? Um, and make it seem like positive emotions should be just a more normal thing. Everyone should be allowed to learn how to stay in these spaces and to cope with things that are difficult. Um, so we are promoting by doing yoga, by journaling, listening to music, being creative, exploring avenues of yourself and what you care about that you might not you know, focus on all the time. Um, and for all of you girls, we are wearing um, green on um, Wednesday as a day of solidarity for all 
all people. I know not everybody has five days worth of green outfits, but if you use the hashtag Green Ribbon Week and you tag me, I will see it and I'll repost you because I appreciate what all of you guys do. You are amazing. Amazing too. So I actually want to go back to the music question. So is there any, I know you've been on like some big stages and being interviewed. So like, you know, there's probably some sort of nerves that come up, especially when you were starting out. Um, so was there ever like one jam that you're like, okay, this is going to hype me up or this is going to get me in the zone? Okay. So this is something that you are going to be completely surprised by. I am a huge music person. I okay. like all types of music. I think country music is the only music I don't listen to. And you, uh, Sheridan moved her face like she was surprised. Girl, not that many people with our age listen to country music. Um, so I like hip hop and rap music the most, but when I'm about to go on stage, I need complete silence. I cannot listen to music. I know athletes like to um, like get hyped up, but because yeah. I talk so much and I talk so fast, I can't listen to fast music before because then I'm in that like athlete mindset, but I'm not an athlete. I'm a, I'm a public speaker. No one is going to a football game when they come hear me talk. So I can't be at a super like ramped up high energy pace. I have to actually be super calm before I go on because I know that for a lot of athletes, it's like, oh yeah, we're, we're about to go be physical and do all these things and hit people. I am not hitting anybody. I am <laughs> sitting at a podium and I'm talking for 50 minutes. So I have to be focused on like just being centered in those words and not, you know, going out there and accidentally doing Drake lyrics while I'm trying to talk about 1000 Black Girl books. So I prefer to be silent. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Marley. This has been so fun. And thank you to everyone for watching. If you want to learn more about teen programming, you can visit us at dclibrary.org slash teens corner. And if you want to find out more about Marley's projects, which you definitely should, you should visit her website at marleydiaz.com or follow her on social media at I am Marley Diaz. So congratulations on bookmarks on Netflix and free on YouTube. Uh, best of luck with your next projects. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. That was so much fun. Yes, bye. Thank you. Bye. Wait, am I actually done? Bye. All right. Thank, thank you guys so much. You are all amazing. Please follow me on Instagram today and I will make sure to follow you back because I'll be looking. So follow me today and I will definitely follow you back. Okay.